Shield. I'm old, so I grew up in a world where arcades were things that we both went to and that mattered. Disgusting hovels full of smoke, people far older and better than us at games beating 10 bells a pump out of you for 20p a go, and a general subculturey feeling to the whole thing. Yes, arcades were at one point really very cool, and by extension so was I. Probably. Maybe. Alright, no, I wasn't cool, but arcades were. And, thanks to the miracle of pricier and much girthier hardware available in arcades, these dens of gaming were where you went to play the absolute best versions of things. Arcade games looked, sounded, and played better than home varietals, and the eternal dream was of arcade perfect in your own house. It happened, sometimes, even before the Dreamcast. It did. I'm not lying. Look, Golden Axe and the Amiga was arcade perfect, yeah? I mean, alright, it wasn't, not technically, but in my mind it was. But, sometimes, it went beyond. Some games came to home systems with more, added features and characters, levels, modified mechanics, even the graphics could be better. Mind blown. How could a home gaming machine spit out something better than what you got in Namco Wonder Park at Meadow Hall? Wait, need to be less specific with that reference. Um, how could a home gaming machine spit out something better than your local arcade? The mind boggles. And yet. Here's a non-exhaustive list of times that exact thing happened. Quick note, titles like Shadow Dancer, Ninja Gaiden, Bionic Commando, Rygar and F-Zero GX didn't make the list because they weren't direct ports. Basically, I've tried not to count spin-offs adaptations that veer too far away from the arcade original, or things that were developed simultaneously. You'll also have to grit your teeth to get through some shoddy arcade emulation on some of the video. Obviously, I'm not negatively judging a game because I couldn't make it emulate well. I'm stupid, but I'm not that stupid. Or maybe I am. Anyway, Tekken Tag Tournament. When it arrived in arcades back in 1999, Tekken Tag Tournament felt like little more than a side attraction to the main series, pretty much a cash-in jumping aboard the pre-millennium tag battle zeitgeist truck. It was a good game, don't get me wrong, and it found an audience, but it was a bit of a meh in the grand scheme of Tekken-y things. Fast forward to 2000, the millennium bug had ruined civilization, Millennium had been adopted as national anthem to newly formed post-apocalyptic nation states the world over, and the PS2 launched with a port of Tekken Tag Tournament that was demonstrably better than the arcade original. Loads of modes, extra costumes, a theatre and a gallery, blah de blah all that good stuff. But what mattered most was A, TTT on PS2 looked a lot better than it did in the arcade, with more detailed character models, 3D backgrounds and other tweaks, and B, it saw the first appearance of Tekken Bowl, life's greatest minigame. There were loads of Tekkens over the years that brought something extra to their home port. Personally, I'm unlikely to ever get over how phenomenal Tekken 3 was on the original PlayStation. Tekken Tag was even redone for PS3, meaning there is technically an even better home version doing the rounds. But for sheer surprise factor, for helping to hammer home that this was a new console capable of great things, and for being my first chance to fight as a King Armor King team at home, TTT on PS2 wins out here. Also Tekken Bowl. Tekken Bowl is life. Contra. It's not optional. In Contra you have to both run and gun. Not that gun is a verb. Also, there's jumping. Basically, the genre is a lie, that's what I'm getting at. Contra's still great, and has been since its first release in 1987. That arcade version, on a screen unsuitable for a horizontally scrolling shooter, was a mix of a couple of different perspectives on the action. Lots of shooting, lots of power-ups, and lots of dying unfairly because the thin play area meant enemies could spring out on you out of nowhere like absolute gits. The NES version, released in the States in 1988, was one of the earlier examples of an arcade game being made better via porting. Made in-house at Konami, the company knew what it wanted to change, what needed to change, and made smart edits. Changes. Damn it, I should have said changes. Right, so Contra on the NES wasn't big on new modes or characters. It looked quite obviously poorer than the arcade version, and it didn't differ hugely from the template laid out in the coin-op. But clever changes made it the better game. Levels were extended and chopped up into separate pieces, lengthening the game a fair amount, while controls were tightened to the point it actually made the arcade original feel slow, like your angry man with a gun was wading through war treacle the entire time. If you go a bit further afield, you'll find Grisor, the Japanese Famicom release of Contra. Thanks to some technical stuff, namely an extra chip powered by hopes and dreams in the game's cartridge, Grisor had features beyond the US version. Cutscenes, maps, trees billowing in the wind. It's pretty cool. You should check it out. Contra on the NES was one of the earliest examples of a home conversion bettering the original, and it's still superb today. And hard. So very hard. Daytona USA. One of the legends of the arcade world, nobody who visited a house of gaming delights in the mid-90s would have missed Daytona USA. It was big, it was present, and it constantly kicked out that tune that will, if I get my way, be the first dance song at my wedding. 
Let's go away. It was ported to the Saturn and PC with middling results, sequels and updates followed to varying degrees of success, but it was the original that won those hearts and burrowed into the brain like the earworm it was. It took a while, but eventually we got proper arcade perfect ports on Xbox 360 and PS3 in 2011, bringing Daytona to those consoles with added things like challenges, online play and glorious high def Mega Graphics 9000 was a natural step. But what made it rise above? What gave it appeal beyond the original arcade version? What won it a spot on this, the most coveted of all lists? Karaoke Mode. Is that the best addition for an arcade to home version ever? Possibly. Also, it helps distract from my terrible driving. Win, win, win. Atomic Runner or Chelnov. You can even call it Atomic Runner Chelnov Nuclear Man the Fighter if you like, makes little difference to me. Anyway, Chelnov was an endless runner from 1988, well before the smartphone era made all that stuff cool again. You played as a little irradiated man caught up in the fallout from an incident strikingly similar to one that happened in 1986 in Chernobyl, because video games have always been riddled with tact, and you ran from left to right battling all manner of creatures and weird things that I can't identify. Chelnov was alright. It stood out not just because of its association with a real-world nuclear accident, but because it offered something a bit different to other games of the era. You could pause running but never actually stop as the screen would push you on, controls were weird in that you only face one direction until using a button to change, and yet yeah, this isn't a full review of the game. It was alright, but nobody paid it much attention beyond the controversy. Four years later and it was ported to the Mega Drive, or Gen E Sice as you call it in America, under the name Atomic Runner, and bereft of any and all allusions to a certain nuclear disaster and 19 mile exclusion zone. But that's not what made it better than the arcade game, no, what did that was the spit, polish, tweaking and general busywork that had clearly been put into the game since its original release. Atomic Runner's home version looked markedly better than that of the arcade, with more detailed sprites and backgrounds, it ran at a nicer pace, the game itself played, as much as you can measure these things, better, and it was all just a far more enjoyable, polished experience. It also has an excellent soundtrack. By no means the first time a home port beat the arcade version, as this mighty list of all lists will tell you, but Atomic Runner was one of the top guys, even in those earlier days. Die Hard Arcade or Dynamite Decker. There was a point when the roaming beat-em-ups of the arcade were my favourites. Final Fight, Golden Axe, Alien vs Predator, Captain Commando, Cadillacs and Dinosaurs… yeah, I'm gonna have to do a video on this, aren't I? But the genre started to fade from view in the mid-90s, with its inevitable move to 3D largely a failure, even though 1. Die Hard Arcade existed, and 1 Part 2. Die Hard Arcade was brilliant. Funny how things turn out. Mixing what I'd say was a simplified Virtua Fighter combat system with early QTEs, a plethora of usable weapons, the Die Hard license, obviously, and a general light-heartedness to proceedings, DHA as all the cool kids never called it, should really have seen a continuation in the popularity of the genre. It was good, it was great, the genre still died. Ten years after DHA's 1996 release, a version appeared in Japan on the PS2. Part of the ludicrously overlooked Sega Ages 2500 series, Dynamite Decker, its licenseless Japanese name, was an arcade perfect plus port of the game that should have saved a genre. There was a Saturn version, and that was spot on to the arcade, but did nothing beyond the original. It was also developed in tandem, so it was disqualified thanks to my harsh rules. The PS2 version updated the graphics, sound and music, added new modes, allowed you to dress up as Axe Battler from Golden Axe, and made you fight Death Adder, threw in one-hit kill modes and arrest modes, added a different bonus game, and on top of all this effort, included the original Saturn and basically the arcade version. It was a robust package. Sequel Dynamite Cop gets a special mention for carrying the torch, minus any John McClane vests, but I'm sticking with Dynamite Decker as one of my favourite examples of the home version providing so very much more than the arcade or original Saturn version could. This ranks highly in my favourite ever arcade conversions ranking list… rank. A spiffing honour, no doubt. Castlevania there was an arcade spin-off of Castlevania in 1988 called Haunted Castle, and a more recent light gun game, but neither of them have directly comparable home versions. No, this one's a bit different, but hey, my video, my rules, my life, stop judging me. VS Castlevania. Versus Castlevania? Versus Castlevania? I have no idea. Anyway, this went the other way around, just to keep you on your toes. The original Castlevania came out on NES, NES, in 1987, a year after its original release on the Famicom Disk System. It was, as you may be aware, brilliant. Hard, as my limited playthrough shows, but brilliant. Rewarding exploration and experimentation, it was far deeper than many platformers and action games of the time, and has gone down in legend. It even has a genre half named after it. Castle Royale, wait, 
Metroidvania, that's the one. Thing is, it was this version that was actually brought to the arcade in the Versus system, a thing Nintendo set up whereby arcade cabinets housed basically NES guts and played NES games, and oh, I can picture so many of your faces as I keep saying NES and it makes me so happy. Anyway, yeah, basically it was home games in the arcade. So why was the home version of Castlevania better? Simply because it was made to be played at home, in your own time, and not in a machine designed to rip as much money from your pockets as possible. Versus Castlevania had a shorter time limit, so you were constantly rushing through levels, rewarded players with fewer hearts, so less ability to use abilities, and, most irritating of all, the already hard game was made much harder as enemies did double the damage of the home game. An exercise in cynicism by Nintendo? Say it ain't so. And yet, it not ain't. It isn't, it isn't ain't, it is so. Crazy Taxi. Once again, it's a video featuring the game with that music you can't actually use on a YouTube video or it'll all get shut down by those fat cats at City Hall. I don't know what I'm supposed to be protesting against here, I'm just trying to join in. Anyway, Crazy Taxi did indeed release first in the arcades back in 1999. A twist on the regular coin-op format of putting a quid in up from 20p and watching a timer count down from 3 minutes to zero, it instead offered a starting time limit and the chance to extend it indefinitely by picking up and delivering passengers to their destinations as quickly as possible. Oh, it was really good too. I mean, you can have all the smart mechanics in the world, but if it isn't fun, it doesn't matter. Crazy Taxi was fun and very successful in the arcades. It also ran on the Naomi hardware, meaning it would be a simple case of, I don't know, flicking some switches and lighting a ceremonial candle or something to port it to a Dreamcast. Fortunately for everyone in existence, Sega went a little bit further than hot wax with its port. While Crazy Taxi in the arcade could last longer than the usual short burst experiences those gaming boutiques tended to provide, it was still a fire and forget thing. Playing at home is a different concept, and it's to Sega's huge credit it understood this and modified the game accordingly. Crazy Taxi on Dreamcast added the ability to choose your own time limit or stick with the original countdown, threw in mini-games to keep challenging players and to help them work on special skills, and, best of all, added an entire new city map to explore. It all came together to make for a wonderful home version of the greatest Uber driver simulator ever made. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Turtles in Time much as it pains me to not say Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles, what can you do? So this was an arcade sequel to the four-player beat-em-up you all loved if you're of a certain age. You know, when things start aching for no reason, young people start doing things you literally do not understand, and the changing price of beans begins to genuinely matter. If you're in that same demographic as me, you played Turtles Arcade. Turtles in Time was more of that, basically, but with time travel. It was good fun, but a classic cash-stealer in the most part. Inevitably, a year after the arcade game's 1991 release, Turtles in Time arrived on SNES and, bar a graphical downgrade and the loss of four-player mode, but then who has three friends anyway, right guys? It happened to be better than the arcade original. And who saw that coming in this of all lists? Literally nobody. Adding new modes, namely Versus and a time trial in an era when this simply didn't happen in arcade conversions was a big part of it, and bringing back Bebop and Rocksteady, for some reason not in the arcade game, was fan service in a good way. On top of all this though, it was a game that had been tweaked respectfully, making it play less like an arcade game somewhat cavalier in its attitude towards your pocket change, and more like a game you play for longer sessions at home. Attacks felt tighter with more accurate hitboxes, entire levels were changed, sewer surfing became less of a chore on SNES, an entire level was added bosses were tweaked or introduced, you got the Rat King on SNES. How could anyone even think the arcade version was better? I'll give the Hyperstone Heist on Mega Drive a shout out because I'm kind like that and it was the one I played more as a kid, but it not being an actual direct port of Turtles in Time, as well as not being as good as the SNES game Sorry Please Don't Kill Me, disqualifies it from the running. Cowabunga, dudes. Mars Matrix. Apparently Mars Matrix is a storyline that goes beyond half a sentence, and that surprised me more than pretty much anything else in my life, truth be told. I admire the moxie of Takumi, the game's developer, for going down the route of attaching some entirely pointless text to a game literally just about shooting a lot of things and trying in vain to avoid the even more things they shoot back at you. Games are art. A bullet hell schmuck from 2000, subtitled Hyper Solid Shooting because of course, Mars Matrix offered a nice little combo mechanic that it took me longer than I care to admit to cotton on to. Clue? Collecting the cube things enemies drop extends your combo time, meaning kills bag more points, meaning you get a higher overall score. It wasn't the best the genre had to offer, but was really good fun all the same. So it was quickly ported to Dreamcast and forgotten about, right? Well. No, Mars Matrix saw an arcade to home port again understanding what players in the living rooms, bedrooms, outhouses, joy chambers, wherever they played it, would want. 
more substance, as well as fixing the scoring system which could be maxed out at 999 billion in the arcade version, Takumi added a bunch more, like an arrange mode mixing up enemy patterns and forcing you to learn levels as if they were completely new, well, apart from the bosses, strategy mode which offered replays of levels to show you how best to do them and to point out to idiots like me how the combo system works, a high score challenge mode, and a shop to spend your hard earned points set for things like more lives and continues, the ability to tweak specific settings, stuff like that. I don't think it's up there with the best games ever, but the home port of Mars Matrix was a fine example of what to alter and how to do it in order to make it something people would actually bother playing more than once. Gauntlet. I was actually a bit too young for Gauntlet to be a fixture of my arcade in youth, but as I hear it was a game where a warrior would go hungry, an elf would get swarmed by angry wizards, and a Valkyrie would run off and steal loads of treasure. An early arcade 4 player game, Gauntlet happily proved cooperation isn't possible between humans and shooting food is the better option over allowing a teammate to grab it. Something like that at least. Anyway, that was 1985. Squeeze your personal time flange softly and we end up in 1993. A different world, a different place. A place in which Gauntlet 4 came out on the Mega Drive, even though it wasn't the fourth in the series and even though Gauntlet was fast approaching a decade in age, and even though a lot of people didn't really care about Gauntlet anymore. So what did we get? Well, on the surface it was a port close to the original arcade quality with the ability to tackle it with four players, though you'd have to purchase extra hardware for that. But it added the chance to play in some different modes. Quest mode, which added an achievable point to the typical dungeon hacking format. Battle mode, which was a survival type mode. And record mode, which recorded your gameplay footage to upload on a proto YouTube that existed back in the early 90s, backed by venture fund capitalists from Panasonic who were looking at ways of making the 3DO more appealing. Oh wait, sorry, record mode, where you beat records. It took a while to arrive, but Gauntlet 4 on the Mega Drive certainly outdid the arcade original. Soul Calibur, 1998, I'm at, insert local arcade, here, and I see a machine bundled into a corner, away from the Tekkens and Virtua Fighters and Street Fighters doing big business. It is ignored. It looks inviting. It… is that Waldo? Holy crap, Spackle. Suddenly I realise there's a Soul Edge sequel and nobody seems to care, and it's brilliant, and it's fun, and Astaroth is a fine replacement for Rock, and yet I'm pretty happy with this. Hopefully the home version, which will obviously come out on PlayStation, will be amazing. 1999. I don't have a Dreamcast, but I hate everyone who does because they all seem to own the best launch title of all time, Soul Calibur, which didn't actually come out on PlayStation because Namco hates me apparently. Except, in hindsight, it's a very good thing this classic weapon em up made its way to Sega's ill-fated console, because it meant Namco did the business. The home port looked so much better than the arcade version, including a new character Cervantes, team battles, galleries, and a wonderfully engrossing mission mode. It was, and is, the absolute gold standard of arcade to home ports, and it was hard to make this video because I just wanted to sit playing Soul Calibur on Dreamcast all day. The difficulties I go through making these videos for you. Soul Calibur 2 is another one that was better at home than in the arcade, and you can't chat about this without mentioning Soul Edge or Blade on the PlayStation as soon as it kicked the whole thing off. But the leap in quality between arcade and Dreamcast for Soul Calibur was so vast, so impressive, I think it left physical scars on my brain thanks to its brilliance. That or I've fallen out of bed too many times. And that's just some games that were better at home than in the arcade. It's never going to be all of them, is it? I'm sure you'll tell me everything I've missed in the comments, as well as screaming, what about Midway Arcade Treasures, or whatever, but I mean, that's just a compilation, which is nice, but it's just all the originals on one disc, you know? Anyway, yeah, add your suggestions. Unless it's Mortal Kombat Gold, which deserves no place on this or any list, unless it's a list of hate. If there's enough that aren't MK Gold, there could be another video on this, especially because playing arcade games is fun. Thanks for watching, do like, share, subscribe, and dream of a world where we used to stand in a dark and smoky room together, throwing ever increasing fractions of the pound sterling into machines in order to try and last longer than 30 seconds against some bigger boys who were always better than us. As has become customary, I'd like to mention my Patreon here, I have one, and if you wanted to chip in to support my work on this channel, that would be amazing. You'd be able to join the likes of these few, who I love dearly. Or, with a bit of a higher contribution, you could join the ranks of these folks who I also love dearly because they help my flat keep on being a flat and not a bin. Video Brains or Jake Tucker, Takara Hoshi, Robbie Sabo, Lola Osman. You're all the best, much love. Bye!